The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will listen to an interview with Mr. Sergeant and a customer care officer of a vacuum cleaning company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello. Yes, hello. It's Tom Berlinson calling from Clean It Vacuum Cleaners. Mr. Sergeant, is it? Yes. I understand you recently purchased a vacuum from us. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, this is simply a call to find out if you've been happy with your purchase. Our company prides itself on its after-sales service. Just because you've bought from us doesn't mean you're no longer important to us. Could you spare a few moments to answer some questions? Sure. How long will this take? Well, not long at all, Mr. Sergeant. Usually only about three or four minutes. OK. What would you like to know? OK, great. I'll just go through the survey form, and uh, if you'll just bear with me, this shouldn't take long at all. Uh, OK, first question. Which model did you purchase and when? Yes, it was the Super Cleaner. We bought it about two weeks ago. Uh, let's see, it was a Monday, I think, because my wife's birthday was on the Sunday, 24th. Uh, that would make it the 25th. Yes, August the 25th. OK. Now, do you remember the name of the salesperson? Was he worth remembering? Yes, his name was Jim. My wife and I were very impressed with him. He was a great source of information, very helpful. Great. I'll make sure that your kind words about Jim are passed on to him. OK, now let's see. Ah, yes. Have you purchased any other products from us this year? Oh, let's see. Uh, of course, we bought the super cleaner. I think that's all. Well, we bought some vacuum bags with it as well. Um, uh, I think Daisy bought some carpet cleaner from your store back in February. That's about all, I think. I have to ask my wife about that one. She's not here at the moment. No, no, that's OK. Your answer will do fine. We don't have to be too picky. OK, so how much money would you say you've spent, all told, in the store? Just an approximate amount will do fine. Wow, that's a difficult question. Uh, I don't really know. The, the vacuum was £150. The other stuff, I'd say around £15, I suppose the total was around £165. But I couldn't be totally sure. It may be a bit more than that. That's fine. That's fine. Now, the next thing on my list is how would you rate the quality of the products you purchased? Good, actually. Very good. So far, we've not had any problems with the products from CleanIt. Service and value have been very good. So I guess you have a loyal customer. Oh, wonderful. I'm really pleased that your experience with our company has been a positive one. Tell me, do you purchase any other items of cleaning equipment? If so, from whom? I'm very fussy about the interior of my car, you know. The seats and carpets, I found a product from Easy Clean which works well on the carpets and an air freshener from Mr Tidy that really smells good. Apart from that, oh, I couldn't say for sure, I think my wife buys floor cleaner from Johnson Brothers. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Well, we've just introduced a new line of car freshness. You might like to stop by. We'll offer you a 20% discount. OK, we're almost to the end of the questions. Now, I know you are happy with Jim, but overall, how would you rate the quality of our service? Fine. I thought it was good. The lady in accounts was a little unfriendly, but overall I would say the service was quite good, actually. Jim made all the difference, and you certainly seem to be a very nice person. Oh, thanks, Mr Sergeant. Please, uh, uh, Tom, call me Terry. Oh, OK, Terry, very good. Second last question. We're thinking of expanding our trading hours. When are the best times, the most convenient for you to shop? 
Oh, I'm not a shopper. I mostly leave it all up to my wife. She works full time. Let's see. For me, I guess I'd have to say Sundays between one and three, and uh, I'm not working on Thursdays now. So if I had to, I guess Thursdays between say eleven and twelve noon. Okay. Last question, Mr. Sergeant Terry. Do you have any other suggestions for us? Anything at all? Well, come to think of it, now there was one thing: turn up the air conditioner. I seem to remember sweltering in there, and it was unpleasant and hot. Also, and this is just me, I always like to have some music playing. You know, quietly in the background. It just makes the place seem friendlier. You know, more professional. Well, I'll certainly mention that to management. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for your time, Terry. If there is anything we can do in the future to help you, don't hesitate to call us. Okay. Bye now. Yes. Bye bye, and thanks again. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk about Bell College. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Welcome to Bell College. The aims of the college is to foster the growth of international understanding through the provision of a high standard educational course. Second, the college is based in a residential setting for adult students from abroad. And last is to make a positive contribution to the development of teaching English. As a foreign language, Bell College is one of a group of schools run by the Bell Educational Trust, a non-profit-making educational foundation. The college offers an attractive environment for study and leisure for students aged 18 or over. 160 students live in comfortable single and twin study bedrooms on the campus, and a further 70 or 80 with carefully selected local families. The excellent common room facilities in the college are matched by the extensive gardens and sports fields. Superb academic facilities, including a modern learning centre and library and sophisticated computer networks, are available for students' use in class hours and in the evenings and at weekends. A wide range of courses is offered in three areas: the main English program, teacher training. And English for specific purposes. The teaching staff are highly qualified native speakers, with wide experience of working in schools, colleges, and universities in many parts of the world. Living in an international community of thirty or more nationalities is an important part of the Bell College experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. The main English program. Teacher training and English for specific purposes. The teaching staff are highly qualified native speakers, with wide experience of working in schools, colleges, 
and universities in many parts of the world. Living in an international community of 30 or more nationalities is an important part of the Bell College experience. Great stress is laid on pastoral care and the college has its own medical centre. A busy and interesting programme of sporting, cultural and social activities is provided in the evenings and at weekends with excursions to many parts of Britain. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and some students discussing choosing courses at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. As you know, this week you choose your modules for the first year of study. So this introductory meeting is aimed at helping you make informed choices. I think the best way to do this is on a question and answer basis. So who'd like to start? Pat? Um, yes, there's something I've been wondering about. Will my choice affect my career opportunities? Hmm. Well, for most students, the choice of Level 1 modules won't be crucial in terms of a later career. In fact, many graduate level jobs will accept graduates from a range of degree courses. Employers will often be at least as interested in how well a student has performed academically and how the whole experience of university has developed the student as a person as in the detail of the course options chosen. Selecting modules that will interest you and in which you think you will be particularly successful is therefore also likely to make good sense in career terms. On certain degree courses, though, module choice can be important. This applies mainly to vocational courses, where the degree confers an accredited professional training as well as university education. Usually the modules students are required to take will include all those needed to meet those professional requirements. Your academic department, in this case chemical and process engineering, and the university's career service will be able to advise you and will be pleased to help you sort out anything you're not certain about. Right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I'd like to ask a few things about the Applied Chemical Engineering module. Fine. What would you like to know? Well, apart from the work on practical engineering, what other topics are covered? Some that might surprise you. One that students always seem to like includes interviewing techniques, presentation skills and producing written reports. Hmm. They sound interesting. How are they taught? Through lectures, practical classes and personal tutorials. 
Applied chemical engineering lasts all year, of course, so there's plenty of time. And what about assessment? Through project work, usually, or dissertation. Not exams as such. Is that the same for the information technology part of the module? Yes. Things like word processing and learning to create spreadsheets are tested in a similar way on this module. That's not the case in some other modules, is it? No, it isn't. Are you thinking of any in particular? Yes, I'm considering doing fluid mechanics. Ah. The work on flow analysis looks interesting and I like the look of some of the other topics too. So, how is that module tested? That's one of those which still uses written exams. Uh, the sit-down formal type, I'm afraid. Oh, that doesn't matter. I quite like that kind as it happens. <laughs> uh, Pat, you've got a question. Um, yes. I was wondering about Science 1 in chemical engineering. How is that organised? Um, it's a bit different from other modules, isn't it? Yes. It aims to give the necessary basis of physics and biology for those students who haven't studied the relevant subjects at A-level or equivalent. In practice, it means that students who have already studied physics are excused the physics lectures, while those who've done biology are exempt from attending the biology lectures. In the second part of the module, you're assessed on your project work in one of those subjects. And does the teaching approach differ too? Yes, particularly in one respect. You're encouraged to learn by working out the solutions to problems for yourself. Hmm. I like the sound of that. OK. Anything else? Yes. I believe it's possible to do a modern language as part of the course. Can you tell me a bit about the Spanish 1A module? Certainly. The main emphasis in 1A is on understanding and speaking, but students also learn to carry out some straightforward reading and writing tasks. Basic aspects of grammar are also introduced and practised. The module comprises 36 hours of class contact, mainly in tutorial groups of 16 to 20, and students are expected to do approximately 64 hours of private study. It sounds interesting. I did some Spanish at the Cervantes Institute last year. Uh, passed an exam, in fact. Ah, I'm afraid that means you can't do 1A. Oh. The regulations say this module may not be taken by students with a qualification in Spanish, though you could do 1B. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about customer psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. An understanding of customer psychology is an invaluable aid for retailers looking for ways to increase sales. Much can be done to the store environment to encourage shoppers to linger longer and spend more money. The first aspect to consider is the physical organisation of the store. Placement of merchandise has a great deal of influence on what customers buy. 
For example, a common practice among retailers is to place the store's best-selling merchandise near the back of the store. In order to get to these popular items from the front entrance, customers have to walk down aisles filled with merchandise that they might not see otherwise. Carpets are also used to direct customers through particular areas of the store. Retailers choose carpets not only for their decorative or comfort value, but also because lines or other types of patterns in the carpets can subtly guide shoppers in certain directions. Besides encouraging shoppers to go to certain areas of the store, retailers also want to keep them in the store longer. One way to do this is to provide comfortable seating throughout the store, but not too close to the doors. This gives customers a chance to rest and then continue shopping. Retailers can do a number of things to create a pleasant atmosphere in the store, thereby encouraging more purchases. Music is commonly used, not as entertainment, but as a calming influence. It can slow the customer's pace through the store, making them spend more time shopping and consequentially making more purchases. Scents are also used in various ways. Everyone has had the experience of being drawn into a bakery by the smell of fresh bread. Experiments have been done with other types of scents as well. For example, the scent of vanilla has been used to increase sales in clothing stores. Use of colour is another important aspect of store environment. Certain colours can affect behaviour as well as mood. Light purple, for example, has been found to have an interesting effect on customer behaviour. People shopping in an environment where light purple is the predominating colour seem to spend money more than shoppers in other environments. Orange is a colour that's often used in fast food restaurants. It encourages customers to leave faster, making room for the next group of diners. Blue, on the other hand, is a calming colour. It gives customers a sense of security, so it's a good colour for any business to use. In addition to using colour to create mood and affect customer behaviour, Colour can also be used to attract certain kinds of customers to a business. Stores that cater to a younger clientele should use bold, bright colours, which tend to be attractive to younger people. Stores that are interested in attracting an older clientele will have more success with soft, subtle colours, as older people find these colours more appealing. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.